All right, so hello everybody. Welcome back to Cosmic Owl Astrology. I am the Cosmic Owl, um, wisdom weaver of this place. And before I dive into what I'm going to talk about today, I will say please subscribe, give me a thumbs up, leave me a comment, but also, you know, thumbs down count for the algorithms too. So even if you are a sensitive snowflake, who doesn't like what I have to say about the election, um, you're welcome anyway. Um, I, I am going to be talking today about the Mars-Pluto opposition, and I am going to look at quite an extensive um, history, and I'm going to look at the presidential candidates and see how this opposition affects them. And yes, Kamala is still going to win. And yes, I'm biased. I want her to win, but I also predicted that 45 would become 45 in 2016, and I did not want him. <laughs> and so, you know, um, anyway, and also astrologers never agree. <laughs> so, yes, there are astrologers who are predicting 45 will win, and I've seen plenty of astrologers predicting Harris will win. And 50% one of us is going to be wrong. We're all taking a good stab at it, and I'm convinced she's going to win. So let's dive into the Mars-Pluto opposition. So the first things I really want to say about the Mars-Pluto opposition is that you're going to hear quite a lot of, like, it's going to be violence, you know, there's going to be... Um, of, uh, you know, a lot of kind of um, um, danger, it's intense, all kinds of things like that. Not from all astrologers, I have to wait, I have to say. But an opposition is, um, is a tense, um, uh, it's a tense aspect. They're kind of uh, facing each other down and we're feeling this already. But, um, and Mars and Pluto are kind of of a similar nature in some ways because they're both um, traditional and modern guide, M Mars traditional, uh, Pluto modern guide for the sign of Scorpio. Though I'm kind of a little bit like, mm, are they really? Um, I don't know. I've found that Pluto um, operates very differently for a lot of people, but anyway. We're going to look at this. Um, Mars is in Cancer uh, currently and will oppose Pluto um, at the very last degrees of um, Capricorn and Cancer, sorry, Cancer where Mars is. And then they will actually oppose each other again, twice more in Aquarius. So I'll look at all three oppositions. Okay, but if you have planets between about, um, I'm going to give it a, a wider orb. It's a big opposition. Um, I'm going to say probably about 25 of cardinal signs, Aries, Cancer, Libra, Capricorn, and probably six or so degrees of the fixed signs, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. You are going to be most affected personally. There could be some hardcore standoffs um, and, you know, there could be some aggression and assertion, of course. But really, energy is neutral. It's how we direct it. And um, an opposition is really kind of looking at the other energy, the other planet. And the key to uh, managing um Oppositions really is integration and coming together in the middle. But it, it's undeniably a, a tense aspect. So I just really, though, in the big scheme of things, do not actually see too much um, aggression. Um, but Mars and Pluto are going to be opposing each other those three times, as I said. And the reason why is that Mars is going retrograde on 6th of December, while still really opposing Pluto. And we'll look at all of that, of course. But this is a really powerful long-term 
opposition. Okay. And, and I'll give my view on it. Okay. <laughs> so first of all, let's look at the energies, uh, energies of these um, aspects. Mars has been in Cancer for a while, and uh, traditional astrology would have us say that Mars is in um, um, the fall in, in fall in Cancer, which means or not optim op not always working at its optimum um, capacity. However, Mars in Cancer really is kind of the guardian, the protector, and I find it quite amusing really that 45 has been coming out with I'm your protector I'm your protector as all this is is happening um which is um real kind of abuser language to be quite honest and so anyway that's my opinion but it is uh for somebody that you know has, is spouting about immigrants and has um had uh, row overturned under his judges and so on like that um, but Mars really is about creating security in your life a sense of security a sense of safety uh, kind of standing at the door guarding but Mars in Cancer can also be rather passive aggressive rather than aggressive and quite moody and triggered it can be a little bit triggered um, when um, I'm very sensitive to criticism as well. All right. So Mars, everything has its shine and shadow. And there's the two aspects of Mars in Cancer. But then we also um, have Pluto finishing up the journey in the sign of Capricorn since 2008. And, and Pluto um, in Capricorn, Pluto's the excavator. Pluto goes down into the sewers, into the shadows, and, and reveals the detritus and the crap and, and shows us what we need to transform and change. Pluto really, though, has a heart. Having had many, many Pluto transits in my life, just because of the way Pluto is in uh, where my chart's made up, I can say every... Um, Pluto transit I've had has ultimately been rewarding and Pluto going through Capricorn um, has been kind of blamed on a lot of the chaos that we've got going out on in the world including the election but Pluto had a lot of rough transits <laughs> during that time that kind of caused a lot of this um, discord and dissent and things including seven exact Uranus Pluto squares five exact Uranus uh, sorry Pluto Eris squares Eris in Aries and squares tend to I find be more contentious almost than oppositions and I have, I live with a Pluto Mars square. So I know that they don't always cause violence. They cause many other things. So the, the two uh, working together are definitely potent and powerful, but they do oppose each other um, every couple of years. And I looked back over many oppositions and they did not always cause any more violence than normal, let's say. But this is at a tense degree, that's for sure. It's at the liminal last degree of the signs. And um, I'm going to be um, quoting from my friend Leah Whitehorse's article, um, The 29th Degree Tales from the Threshold. And that really leads me to where we are now. So let me get the charts up for a second. And I'm gonna go way back in history in a second, but I'm just gonna tell you, and we're gonna look at these upcoming oppositions and why I think it's gonna be um, different. Okay, so Mars, or why it's going to be like the ending of something, if you like. So Mars is going to oppose Pluto. First time, two days before the election. Now, this 
is taking place at 29 degrees Cancer, 29 degrees Capricorn, birth to death, squaring, well, this is uh, the midpoint of Mars and Pluto, which is at 29 Libra. I point out things I would like to say about that. Um, it's out of sign conjunction to Juno. I have things I would like to say about that, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, it's also square to Hygieia, which is the holistic as uh, the asteroid of holistic health and very much having a seer quality. And well, there are other aspects because, of course, we've got so much at these ending signs. Really, it's in an aspect to um, a sextile aspect to Uranus and a trine aspect or a sextile from that to Neptune. This is ending something. This is a threshold. We are really finishing up a journey. You know, Mars and Pluto have opposed each other every couple of years since 2000. Well, they do it every couple of years, but in, in these signs since 2008 and have really been looking at what we need to cut out, what we need to change so that we can really uh, birth something new. So the death of something in Capricorn and the birth of something perhaps in Mars, you could say. Now the 29th degree, I said I was gonna quote from my friend Leah Whitehorse's article. Um, it's at leahwhitehorse.com and it's called the 29th degree tales from the threshold um she quotes Ant anthony louis in and this um says that says a planet in a critical degree is like a person wandering through a demilitarized zone between north and south korea it's a risky place to be and we are at this big major turning point really of deciding which way we're going to go as a country in so many ways are we going to birth something new as in renewal and kind of regenerate what um, a better version of what we already have or are we going to go tower card and completely cause um, destruction I know which way I think we're going to go but we'll see <laughs> But it's a sensitive degree. All right. It's um, Leah describes it as the ultimate no man's land. It's sensitive and a volatile degree. But of course, you know, um, it, it's like a critical moment of change. 29 degrees. Mars is going to go into Leo, but then we'll come back into the sign of cancer. But Pluto is about to leave Capricorn for the last time on November the 19th. So this first opposition is happening just 16 days before Pluto leaves Capricorn for good. So it's really kind of activating something more. There's gonna be no more aspect, no more of these aspects in this sign um, this is kind of like almost like a void, of course. This is finishing something, okay. Um, and fate and karma is in motion, if you like, from all those building of the oppositions before. But let's give you some of uh, my friend Leah's uh, kind of other keywords for this after saying that she said, at its best, the 29th degree can be a wise teacher who has mastered all forms of expression in that sign placement. And it can be a degree of great maturity, a sage or a guru. So have we learned and have we matured enough collectively for this opposition? All right, so the 29th degree of a sign can give us the following attributes and associations. So it's a heightened expression for sure. It can be a catharsis, a kind of real kind of like final purging and clearing out. It can bring wisdom and mastery. It can be a harbinger of big change and a catalyst for that change. And it's a crisis, which also means a crossroads. Okay, so 
you know, Mars is also a surgeon and Mars is kind of looking Pluto straight in the eye on this conjunction saying, let's look, take a one last hard look at what action Mars we are going to take about the shadow that's being revealed collectively in our structures, in our institutions, in our society, in all that kind of energy. Now, of course, the midpoint is at 29 Libra. It, well, it could have been over here, but it's not. And I will say that this was the degree of the first star point in Libra, Venus star point, that was on October the 22nd, 2022, just before the midterm elections. All right. And, you know, you could look back at all other things. So um, it's clear this is all affecting the USA because we're coming out of the Pluto return. Well, we've still got a long way to go, really. This is still close to the US Pluto, but I'm going to look at some other things as well. Now then, before I go and look at the other two that happen um, um, on the other dates, so I will quickly tell you that they are January the 3rd, one degree um, Leo Aquarius, and then April the 26th, 2025, at three degrees of Leo and um, Aquarius. We're going to go back in time. Okay, so give me one second. And the chart I'm going to use was really, well, I'm actually going to, mm, which one first? Oh my goodness, because there's a couple around that time. So mm, let me look at this one first. Oh my goodness, where did it go? <laughs> Nope, not that file. Oh, did I even save this one? Excuse me for doing this. Sorry about this, everybody. Oh, actually, I'm going to look in here. Simple name search. I'm obviously not meant to look at this one, which is fine because I'm going to go and look at um, Jamestown. Now, Jamestown was when the first slaves were brought ashore. Okay, and this was, you know, obviously like well before the constitution of the US, well before the formation of the United States itself, but really it was kind of the formation of what became the US, um, the USA. Um, let's go to find that chart again. I'm sorry about this. And I'm going to find it and look. Okay, I've got it. But I will put that up in a minute. And I, I so I do want to say that what I was quite astounded because this was August the 20th, 1619. And um, okay, I must I can't have saved this chart, so I've got to get it up because I'm I'm I thought I knew American history pretty well because I've studied it and I'm very interested in it. But I do want to bring this one is in as well. Um, it was at 6 a.m. Plymouth. Hmm. And let's look at this first. So the pilgrims. Uh, landed uh, on Plymouth Rock um, on December the 21st, 1620. All right. So, 
bearing in mind some of those degrees I talked about, we do have this um, Aquarius degree activated and we'll look at that. And so I looked at the Plymouth Rock one and I was like, you know, what's happening with this Mars Pluto opposition? So I will come back to it a little bit. But even more astounding to me was this Jamestown chart. I've had this Jamestown chart for quite a long time, but notice that the first slaves were brought ashore before the pilgrims landed on Plymouth Rock. This is really embedded into the history of the USA. But the, then the, um, 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 the pilgrims came after that, escaping persecution, you know, all that kind of energy. So bear with me one second. I want to get to that first uh, Mars-Pluto opposition. What astounded me here? Okay, because I think it's okay. I think we could probably all, ag all agree that the modern United States and co the colonizers all came from white Europeans and women were not included. They were not, you know, given the vote um, as it progressed. Um, women were generally thought of as chattels back then as were, but slaves even more so. So, you know, the uh, all that came ashore really was, um, you know, all the history um, that I studied when I was in college, because I studied American history, was written from the perspective of white men, the, the winners, basically, and white European men, for the most part. So this chart really kind of, um, I was like, I've got I have some reason I've got to go back to this. Now, one other thing I want to mention before um, I um, dive in is I think we're dealing with massive uh, trauma patterns, epigenetics. And so I have to thank my friend Erica Robinson on her In the Company of Cards YouTube channel. Her late, one of her latest videos, um, let me just uh, tell you what it's called. I'm gonna link to it in the back, but it's In the Company of Cards. And it was, it was not the latest video because she's done more. <laughs> she's, on, she's doing quite a few right now, but this one was called 2024 Presidential Race, Who is Ahead, Anyone? And she mentioned the epigenetics part. She's got an interesting take on the epigenetics part, which I will not comment on because it's not my place to do so, but it ties in with this, it ties in with everything. So over here at 29 degrees of cancer where mars is in the sign of birth we have venus which represents women but represents relationships it also represents all that is other um being you know in our lives so those we are in relationship with so you know it could be women marginalized people um, it's the divine feminine, and here's the divine masculine. On this moment when the slaves were brought ashore. So I think everybody, every marginalized group is here. But also, look at this. Nessus, the revealer of um, abuses of power. Nessus has been active by transit where it is now in the sign of Pisces, for revealing um, um, intergenerational traumas for everybody and collectively. Nessus is currently over here, which is interestingly at the bottom of the chart, the foundation of this chart. You cannot make this stuff up. Add to that, that at that time, Uranus was also close by and Uranus is often been related to trauma also uh, most particularly by um, Mark Jones 
who I'm going to be interviewing for a, a, a gathering that I'm offering uh, that will be going out in January. Then we go to that, the opposite side, and here we have Vesta, asteroid Vesta in Capricorn. And Vesta really is the flame of the hearth. It's kind of the, what keeps the hearth alit. And at that time, Pluto was transiting Vesta, opposing it in this chart. And even more, <laughs> the midpoint and, the, and squaring this opposition in this chart, oh, by the way, all of this, Venus, Nessus, Uranus was all in the eighth house, which is also kind of a house of um, often power games and manipulation and uh, power struggles. And this affected the self-worth of the country. There's so much more I could say about this chart. It's, it's a very powerful chart and has been activated quite a lot in many ways. And by the way, Pluto, was in Taurus back then. And um, somebody did mention on a YouTube, I can't remember who it was, that somebody had, uh, they, they talked about the USA Pluto return. And we're like, we've already had one, you know, we've already had several. There was all these um, steps in the foundation of the USA. So anyway, but this Mars Pluto opposition here, but look at this over here, squaring the Mars-Pluto opposition and where the midpoint is that I already mentioned in the chart, we have Juno. And Juno is our sacred partnerships. Juno is the, kind of the yin and yang. She was also, um, um, she also really represents marriage, our sacred marriage with each other. This was with the trauma patterns of Uranus and Nessus and all of this, we are looking at our collective shadow that started way back when of being a, a, a country that was founded by white European males, uh, primarily WASP, you know, Anglo-Saxon Protestant, my blood, if you like, but you know, um, um, and and it's all coming back in. Uh, there's, incidentally, the South Node is also on Neptune at that point, uh, or the South Node, the where it is now, is on the Neptune of that chart, um, and you, well, you can you can kind of see it. Uh, the Mercury, the Moon are on the ascendant of that chart saying it's time for a new story um, in many, many ways. Um, Venus and Pallas Athena are on the Black Moon Lilith of that chart on this first opposition. Um, she's the problem solver. This is, you know, time for a new vision, a new story. Um, Black Moon Lilith um, was at 21 degrees Sagittarius back then Jupiter has just stationed retrograde opposing that and it had Saturn opposing black moon Lilith and there was an, a black astrologer on Twitter her name was Giardi I think I saw a video way back when where she actually associated Saturn with uh, black people and Saturn was in the seventh house of um of relationships, significant relationships. So that's all been highlighted as well. Um, oh my goodness, there's just so many connections in this chart. It's quite astounding, all right. And interestingly as well, the kind of the core wound in this chart, if you like, was Chiron at 29 degrees Aquarius, another liminal space. <laughs> It was not a good day to do this. It kind of embedded some really core damaging wounds of abuses of power and um, control and trauma into um, what came ashore um, on that day energetically. So, you know, this is just astounding to me. Now then, I do want to go back to, uh, quickly go back to that Plymouth Rock chart, which was a, a bit after. Can you believe that um, 
you know, Plymouth Rock was actually after the first, first slaves were brought brought aboard. Uh, sorry. So the midpoint of Mars and Pluto in that chart was at 29 Cancer. So, you know, Mars, <laughs> Mars and Pluto were in an entirely different place at that time. Mars was at 16 Libra and Pluto had moved to 11 Taurus by that point. So they were actually kind of in a quincunx to each other, but they were in Venus signs. And we already saw that Venus was affected by this um, current Mars-Pluto opposition. So all this control and domination, all the shadow of all of the control and domination by the dominator culture of um, the indigenous tribes and all the uh, stuff about colonization was embedded into this way before the um, founding of the USA itself. Does that make sense? And it's and this Mars Pluto opposition is a crossroad and a turning point. I think are we gonna are we gonna be done with this and reinvent ourselves and write a new story? Um, oh, what are we becoming? We're at this liminal threshold space on this Mars-Pluto opposition. So I'd like to invite you to go deeper. But at a personal level, it's Mars-Pluto opposition. And I did give you the degrees that you're going to feel it at personally. It's looking directly into the shadow and birthing something new for you too. So um, let's also bring up... The USA's chart and I'm going to look at the Sibley chart because that's the most commonly used and so the Mars um, the Sibley chart you can see that Pluto oh, you know we're still really under the Pluto return and so Mars really is opposing it and then we've got this star here called Altair right and so um, Altair is um You know, I didn't know much about Altair, okay. but then um, I've actually just done an interview with Andrew Smith out of Ireland, and he's in my quantum astrology gathering too, and he talked about it and, and said a similar thing. But Altair is really of the nature of Mars and Jupiter, apparently. It's bold, confident, valiant, unyielding, ambitious. This is the traditional representations of it. Um, but it's also um, referred to as the Eagle Star. And what is the symbol of the USA? But the Eagle. Okay, so really, the USA is being reborn in some way. <laughs> it's it's not going to look the same, but it definitely has this more um, confident, liberal kind of nature and taking command. And so, but it can bring some blood spread, bloodshed too. But looking at its higher energy, because some of these um, um, some of these fixed stars have such negative kind of. Um, interpretations by the ancients. It's both ambitious and liberal, but it can also, if expressed negatively, i.e. the shadow with Mars looking directly out at it, cause disgrace, misfortune and ruin. And so, you know, oh, which are we going to get here? Which one are we going to get in the US? So I'll look at the candidates. Um, for president as well. And I know I'm going to get some snowflakes moaning about it again. But anyway, that's all right. Interestingly, also um, on the Astrology King, he said, um, Altair in the Eagle has a Mars character with a blend of Mercury and Jupiter. So there's Mars again, and Jupiter just turned uh, uh, retrograde. So we've got all these things speaking to each other. So 
but you know really kind of think about this as the eagle you know and how it's affecting the usa okay now then this um let me move to the next one <laughs> the next opposition so we have three oppositions because mars does not go retrograde very often and especially opposing pluto and they're opposing pluto for this whole they're opposing each other really for this whole period because mars only gets back uh, gets to six leo which is on the north node of the usa <laughs> and then goes back to cancer they do kind of separate for a while before the last one so after the election so only uh, four weeks after the election and it is affecting the USA. So I am going to talk about it. We have Mars opposing Pluto again. And this time, Altair is traveling with it. So um, where was the Altair in um, US chart? Altair in the US chart was at two, but where was it um, in, uh, sorry, was at 28 Capricorn. And where was it way back in um, Jamestown? Altair was in, um, in the Jamestown chart, 26 Capricorn. So you can see that the Altair was around those last degrees of Capricorn for all those early days as well. But then Altair, by progression, or precession, sorry, moved into the sign of Aquarius at some point and started to move towards the future. I haven't found the date yet where it moved into Aquarius. I, I still have that to look for. But Mars opposed Pluto. Look at this. And, and it's going to be at one degrees. One, a new beginning with that eagle writing a new story. One, the midpoint is now at one Taurus stability in so many ways now then let's have a quick look how that affects the usa chart so here's the usa chart and uh, not a lot is happening there but well I, i'm not going to go into all the details so at one degrees, the middle one is, is just going to be a new beginning, I think, in so many ways. Let me go back to that Jamestown chart. Do we have much at one degree around that chart? No. So all of this pain was embedded in, uh, in those early founding days. I picked that chart because it's so profound. And then on... Um, in April, April the 26th to be exact, Mars opposes Pluto for the final time um, in this time. And the uh, midpoint is at three Scorpio. It's gonna be uh, almost opposing the sun at that, that time. Uh, the sun really is square to this. The sun in stable Taurus, uh, there's, um, this is close to the south node and the north node of the USA, incidentally. So let's have a little look at the USA's chart. So after the retrograde, after the lessons that have been learned, Mars is still in the shadow of that last opposition, looking at the shadow, how we're going to change and then Mars is going to hit the north node of the USA and say, we're time to take action and take the lead in a new way. At that point, the midpoint is in three Scorpio, and that one takes place in the sign of um, the people in or in the house, rather, of, of groups, large groups, um, clans, whatever you want to call them. And it's also hopes and wishes for the future. It's also much future projection. I really kind of feel that um, America is going to choose, shall we say, to create this new story, this new future. Now, of course, this will apply everywhere in the world to a degree with this shift of Mars 
but if your area of the world is affected by it, then by these aspects, then you will feel it more. If you, um, um, what was I going to say? Oh, I like that the sun and moon are in the fifth house too as well of leadership. But anyway, there's loads more I could say, and I'm not going to. But I will say the last time that Mars was opposing Pluto in um, these signs was, of course, around this time. So I'm going to go back to that time and then we're going to look at the candidates charts for um, um, for this Mars-Pluto opposition. So we've gone back to that. So let's get to the Mars opposing Pluto. So the first, there was one in 1776 and that was at 26 Cancer and that was right, you know, at the kind of founding, if you like, and that was when there was still a lot of kind of, um, you know, um, uh, war going on and stuff. Then by um, August the 13th, 1778, Mars and Pluto opposed each other at zero Aries, which is where um, we've had so, uh, oh, sorry, zero Aquarius Leo oh, um, is where we've had so many potent points. I'll go over those again in a minute, but let's have a look at the history of 1778 briefly when we had that Mars Pluto opposition there. This was when the Treaty of Amity and Commerce and the Treaty of Alliance signed in Paris between the United States and France was negotiated by the United States. This, the first established formal diplomatic and commercial relations and the second form, formed a defensive alliance. You could almost say it was like the seeds of NATO, okay. Um, or this European US alliance. Then there was another one on July the 30th, 1780, which was at three degrees Leo Aquarius, which if you remember is the degree of the third one that we've got coming up in April. So let's have a quick look at the major events of the history of that one as it was in the USA. Pennsylvania became first US state to abolish slavery. So things began then, okay. You know, things began that uh, started to transform what we are now. Since that point, you know, the USA's whole load of history, now we've gone through the first Pluto return of the 1776 version of USA. And all of this, to my mind, uh, really does tell me, my, I've long said, and I still think this is going to happen, that we are going to rewrite a, write a new kind of constitution or constitutional amendments and, and transform the USA into a vision of some, something that was not just all men created e um, equal, as in all white men, but all humans created equal, and so on and so forth. I think, you know, there's going to be massive transformation and reweaving and rewriting of the new story. So, where are Arts, our present candidates. Let's have a look. Oh God, I've hidden the wrong file again. Oh, I love this. Here she is. So I'm going to look at Kamala first. And remember, we are looking at uh, Mars Pluto at the 29th degree and then at one and three degrees of fixed signs. So the 29th degree of the cardinal signs. So in this one, Pluto is in her eighth house of shared resources and Mars in Cancer is in the second house of self-esteem, our values and all kinds of things like that. Uh, it really kind of feels to me like 
you know, this is purging. But not only that, and I see this as a positive thing. I'm going to draw some lines. This opposition is, um, well, the midpoint here is on her sun, pretty much opposing her moon. And, um, and all of this is squaring her full moon. Now, some people might say that's um, not good, but I think this is kind of pushing for change and is going to bring the change that we um, are moving towards. OK, so let me look at other aspects um, from this Mars Pluto opposition. I will be briefly kind of just tuning in to anything else. Well, of course, you know, it's in a semi sextile to her Saturn and a quincunx. She's ready to make the necessary adjustments, it feels like, to what's needed to be done. OK, so clear those drawings. I'm just going to I'm not going to draw any more things on. But after that, you know, we see it's come here. So Mars. Uh, sorry, Pluto will be on her natal altar. Mars will be opposing it. She doesn't have a lot at one degrees, but it's a new start in the second house of her chart. Self-esteem, self-worth. Mars um, over here, the leader in her second house of how you earn your money. <laughs> um, there's other things I could say, but I'm not going to. So April. It's only moved on to three degrees and three degrees. What does she have around three degrees? Not a huge amount. So it's the early ones that are affecting her most. Oh, the one degree one did actually square her Mercury in Scorpio, you know, of like voicing for the hurt and the pain. Okay, so let's have a look at how it affects at the other candidates um, chart. This adds to my feeling that um, she's going to win, by the way. And so bring it on. Fragile 45 followers because you, you, you can make all the personal attacks you want. I don't actually care. You add to my algorithms when you comment on it as well. So, oh. So let's have a look at this first one, which is really the most critical. This one is in a semi-sextile aspect to his um, ascendant, which is, you know, not the easiest of aspects. A semi-sextile aspect um, is uncomfortable. They have no traits in, in common. They can't kind of see each other. They're over here. It's... Um, it really is considered a minor aspect, but I can hear Rick Levine saying there's no such thing as, <laughs> as, um, semi, as a minor aspect. OK, but they do bring a subtle influence. So this is affecting his identity in the world. OK, so so this is it can encourage personal growth through minor adjustments and new perspectives, but it really is a push for a more gentle nudge for growth. But this Mars is just entered his 12th house of hidden enemies, but also fears and fears of hidden enemies and so on. Um, there's other things hitting his chart as well, of course. Um, does it aspect anything else in his chart? No. I, I don't think I'm going to go through the one degrees and the three degrees because none of them really hit his chart as much as this first one. This is a powerful one because of where it is in his chart. If you remember, Mars in Cancer was in Harris's second chart by transit that Pluto in here is in his sixth house of uh, everyday work, but it's changing, it's transforming. He's not gonna, you know, um, he's, he's um, 
um, his everyday life is going to change and not in the way that you th might think it would. What's more interesting is the Mars encounter over here being in the house traditionally of, quite honestly, imprisonment. Not saying he's going to go to prison, but, you know, I, to my mind, it just adds to my feeling that Harris is going to win. And that this Mars-Pluto opposition, at its essence, is asking us, what kind of country do we want to be? But for you personally, it's, it's asking you what big changes you are making after these Pluto and Capricorn years, what you've learned, what wisdom you've gained and what you want to birth and how are you birthing more of that um, more protective, more kind kind of energy, which is Mars in Cancer, after digging up the shadow of perhaps where you've been overly um, assertive at times, but it's definitely, um, you know, staring the shadow deep in the face. And for some people that could be a bit eruptive. So I'm not saying there will be no challenging um, moments with this, um, but overall, I see this as real kind of purging of the patriarchy, <laughs> to be quite honest. It's, it's like the first aspect is kind of saying, we're done with this. Looking back at what was formed, we're done with how this country has, um, I mean, it's a wonderful country in many ways, but let's face it, it was built for a certain male hierarchical dominator culture and we didn't even get the ERA like, you know, passed for the Equal Rights Amendment. And there are people now and their shadow is being emerged. Look up Theo Bros, who would actually like to overturn the 19th Amendment. Well, I don't think it's going to happen. I think, um, you know, I think people, the, um, the uh, trajectory is towards writing a new story, Aquarius. I know it has its quirky autocratic side, but also Aquarius is the people and Leo is the king. So we are kind of going, we want the people, all the people to be represented and uh, guided by our, whoever we choose to be our ruler in future. So that's my view on this Mars opposition to Pluto. Leave me your comments and, um, have a wonderful time.